All right, folks. My name is Alexis Alvarez. For those who don't know me, I am the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is, I believe, the third installment in our training series designed for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And today we have a very special topic, a topic that's really, really important um, to, to survivors of domestic violence and folks who are, have housing instability, um, housing rights for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And I'm very excited for the speakers that we have here today because uh, they are experts in both the, the housing field, the survivor field, and they've come together to bring you this amazing presentation. So this presentation is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent out within 24 hours. That email will come from Zoom, not from me, but I will put my email into the chat for anyone that might wanna jot it down. If they missed the email in their inbox, you can always reach out to me directly. Uh, additionally, this was approved for CLE credit. We also did get some bias elimination credit uh, for this one. So uh, at the end, I will pop that CLE code into the chat. I will also read it out loud and that CLE code will be included in that email along with the recording. So don't worry, we will get you your credits. Questions and answers. Please feel free to drop any questions that you have into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, our, our presenters are going to do their best to answer those in live time. We really wanna facilitate a conversation and a discussion. Um, so please don't be shy, please get in there. Um, and uh, thank you in advance for participating. I know some folks are shy, so I know it's tough and we really appreciate you being a part of what we're trying to do today. And so I believe I've hit all the housekeeping announcements. <laughs> and with that, I will go into the introductions of who we have here with us today. In no particular order, we have Erica Recheck, who is the Director of Survivor Advocacy at Florida Legal Services. Since graduating from the University of Florida in 2007, Erica has spent most of her legal career working in public interest law, ensuring that individuals in vulnerable situations have a voice in the judicial process. She started her career working for Legal Services of North Virginia, helping survivors of violent, domestic violence with their legal issues related to protection orders, family law related matters, housing, and consumer law issues. Upon her return to Florida, she continued her career with the Community Legal Services of Mid-Florida, where she handled family law and housing law matters and assisted with the management of a multi-county legal helpline. Erica joined Florida Legal Services in 2018 and continues to assist survivors of domestic violence while also engaging in systemic impact advocacy for vulnerable populations. She's a member of the Florida Bar, the Virginia Bar, and the U.S. Middle District of Florida. We also have today with us Joseph Cordova, uh, the attorney and Fair Housing Project Manager, uh, the project manager for the Fair Housing Project uh, at Florida Legal Services. Joe spent the first two years of his legal career as an Equal Justice Works Fellow, uh, practicing community lawyering for immigrant families. He has since transitioned to such efforts into housing discrimination enforcement and outreach, where he manages Florida Legal Services Fair Housing Initiative Project via the HUD funding FHOI and EOI programs. He has a bachelor's degree from DePaul University and a master from the University of Colorado in public policy and a JD from the University of Florida, Levin College of Law. He has over a decade's experience working with vulnerable populations, performing community development services and was recognized by the Levin College of Law with the 2018 Helen Gibble Bleachman Memorial Community Service Award. I am incredibly honored to be here today uh, with these two folks, not just because I get the pleasure to work with them, but because I've seen them in action. They are incredible advocates and uh, it's gonna be an awesome, awesome presentation. So thank you, Joe and Erica for being here today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for having us. And I wanna say I've had the, um, it's been my honor over the last, I think few months dating back to early in summer, um, Alexis has invited me to be a part of some of these presentations and I wanted to give a big thank you to you. Um, I'm, it's much easier to do my job with you holding so many of the reins and doing these presentations and putting it together. So thank you so much. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in everybody. Um, so we're talking about housing rights for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. We're gonna talk about the Fair Housing Act and other protections today. And let me get, there we go. So what we're gonna talk about the Fair Housing Act is protections. The Fair Housing Act's prohibit prohibition on sex discrimination. 
protections for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault under the Fair Housing Act and the Violence Against Women Act. And we're talking about how to take action. So some of the common housing issues that survivors face, and we're definitely gonna go into more detail about each one of these as we, as we discuss, but we're talking about discrimination. And what's interesting about when we talk about discrimination is that a lot of times you might not be thinking, well, are survivors of domestic violence a class of people that is discriminated against, as in people have prejudice against survivors? There might be plenty of people who do, but it's not really the common concept when you think about people facing discrimination, as in I'm prejudiced against this class of people. But it does come up. It either comes up intentionally or it comes up indirectly. And that's really what we're talking about today when we talk about discrimination is that sometimes that discrimination comes up even though people don't, they're not aware that they're doing it. Or, you know, they're aware of they're doing it, but they're trying to kind of sneak it under the radar or something like that. So when we talk about discrimination, we're talking about denying access to housing. You might have discriminatory policies. We'll talk a little bit about disparate impact and the idea that it, you have a policy that's neutral on its face, but it's discriminatory in its in implementation. And one of the biggest things survivors face is that if they have evictions on their record, a lot of times they're denied housing in the future, but the eviction is actually due to the acts of domestic and sexual violence that was played upon them. So they're being victimized not only once, but later on they're being blamed for it and they're suffering the consequences of losing out on future housing opportunities. They also don't have uh, very often access to safe housing. And a lot of times when you are denied housing or access to housing, it leads to homelessness. And so we'll, we'll dive in here and we'll talk about first the Federal Fair Housing Act. This is one of the first protections available to um, survivors of domestic violence. So the Federal Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing, which includes rentals, leasing, buying and selling, or financing of a dwelling, a home, an apartment unit, based on a person's belonging to the protected class. I wanna highlight what we're talking about. We talk about the Federal Fair Housing Act. This is true across the country. We talk about seven protected classes, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. Every state has their own Fair Housing Act. In the state of Florida, the Florida Fair Housing Act is almost verbatim the same as the Federal Fair Housing Act. But as you go um, narrow, more narrow into different jurisdictions throughout the states and throughout the state of Florida, you're gonna have different county ordinances, different municipality um, ordinances um, and, and laws and regulations and enforcement. So you might actually have additional protections depending on what state you're in, what county you're in, what city you're in. When we talk about the Federal Fair Housing Act, we're talking about seven protected classes. And in relationship to the implementation of VAWA, uh, we, we are talking nationwide. But hopefully, if, if you have questions and stuff like that regarding your jurisdiction, if we don't have the answer, just know that the answer does exist somewhere because it might exist more locally. Um, so what types of housing are covered? Under the Federal Fair Housing Act regarding any sort of protection, we're talking about private and public housing, renting, buying, selling, like I mentioned before, mortgage lending. Home appraisals are covered, home insurance, housing assistance, and any kind of advertising and marketing. And just real quick, I'll talk to you about some of the exceptions because we do see this quite often when we're talking about protecting survivors of domestic violence from housing discrimination. Under the Federal Fair Housing Act, any owner occupied building with no more than four units, it's actually an exception to the rule of Federal Fair Housing. This is what's commonly referred to as the Mrs. Murphy Law. So the idea here is that Mrs. Murphy is, um, it's kind of a, a, a made up story, but Mrs. Murphy is a widow and she lives in her home all by herself now and she wants a roommate. She's allowed to choose who she wants to live with, even if it does come from a place of prejudice or discrimination. She's just not allowed to advertise or make a statement about it. So if she wants to live with a woman because she's more comfortable living with other women in her home as a roommate, she has a right to do that, but she's not allowed to tell applicants, sorry, don't apply because you're a man. This is gonna come into play often if you are someone in a situation where you say, I would love to rent to you, but based on your history of eviction and domestic violence, I, I, I don't want that quote unquote stuff around my home. Well, you're discriminating against someone for being the victim of domestic violence. That might bleed itself into disparate impact, which we'll talk about later on. The same exception goes for single family houses that are being sold or rented by the owner without the use of an agent. 
And this is um, as long as you own less three or less, three or fewer uh, rental properties. So if you're an individual who lives in your home and you have an investment property on the other side of town that you rent out for extra income, you're ex you do have an exemption from the Fair Housing Act. Again, you're allowed to choose who you want to live there, but you absolutely cannot advertise or make any sort of statement regarding discrimination or prejudice. So if you make your mind up in your own mind and no one ever knows about it, I guess you're going to be <laughs> accepted. But it's really hard to stay under the radar of those exceptions because prejudice is going to come out. Discrimination is going to come out. And I'll also mention this. If you are the owner of a single family home that you're renting out, um, you know, to you, you're, you're the landlord and you use anybody else to help you rent that out. So you use an agent or even like another family member that your partner's with. I own the property, but my cousin handles all the landlord issues. That counts as you're now using an agent to assist you with this the exception doesn't, doesn't apply to you anymore, okay? And then we have this across the country, but definitely in the state of Florida, housing for older people. So 55, 65 and older communities, they do not have to rent to families with children. And then any sort of housing operated by a religious organization is allowed to specify that this is a religious community so we can um, you know, prefer members of our own religion to participate in our living community. But if you make one exception for one, you have to make sure you're making an exception for everybody. You, you can't um, claim to be a religious organization and then kind of discriminate from there. You, you, the idea is that you're, you're, you're sticking within the religion that you're, you're promoting the housing for. So let's talk about these protected classes before we get even further into the domestic violence conversation of today. So there's seven protected classes nationwide. We have race and skin color. Those are different. Race is gonna talk about your heritage, your bloodline, your identity. Skin color is literally just the color of your skin, okay? One of the um, topics around race and skin color that is kind of gaining a little bit of momentum throughout the country, I believe in Maryland, there might be one city in Maryland, maybe even the entire state, I believe Louisiana or possibly just New Orleans just passed a law referring to the Crown Act, C-R-O-W-N, it refers to hairstyle. Um, it, the idea being that we have a lot of wonderful folks coming from other cultures and other countries into the United States and the hairstyle that they bring forth is a wonderful reflection of the beauty of their culture. But when they apply for a job, the uh, employer is saying that kind of hairstyle is not allowed in our office workplace. The Crown Act is supposed to be protecting people from bias and prejudice against culturalistic um, presentations, which includes hairstyle. It's not a part of the Fair Housing Act yet, but it is an example of something that is gaining momentum throughout the country. And I want to tie, I bring that up mostly to make sure people understand the Federal Fair House, Housing Act, it's a living document. It was passed in 1968, but it was only passed with four protections. About four or five years later, we added protections and another 14 years later, we added more protections. So the seven that we have now, we might have nine in five years. We might have 13 in 10 years. So it's, it's a living document. In addition to race and skin color, we have national origin. This talks about you cannot discriminate against somebody based on the country that they're from or the country that their family is from. So you may have been born and raised in the United States, but your grandparents were from another country and that you know, is a part of who you are. That can't be used against you to deny you housing. Just a quick note, currently the Federal Fair Housing Act does not protect against immigration status-based discrimination. But there is a court case right now that's moving its way up to the appeals um, courts. It's Reyes v. Waples. And it talks about the idea that uh, an apartment community is not supposed to be demanding proof of immigration status before they allow you to rent. Well, you know, people who are um, saying it's okay to do that, those are the ones saying that the Federal Fair Housing Act only protects against national origin, it doesn't say anything about immigration status. But the advocates on behalf of the plaintiffs are saying you can't have one without the other. You, you, you can't say, prove to me you're allowed to be here, otherwise I'm not going to rent to you. Because the people you're asking that to are 100% of the time going to be people from other countries. You're never going to ask someone born in the United States, prove that you have a right to be here. So that's an example of some disparate impact um, cases that we're keeping our eye on in regards to national origin. In regards to religion, um, any religion, any and all religions and religions that people don't practice, people who choose not to pr practice any sort of faith or spirituality, that's also protected. Oh, I see a question here in the chat. Um, 
Oh, I love that question, Alexis. Thank you. So do we have any protections that could possibly be taken away from us? Well, if Congress decided to, I guess they could rewrite the law to say we no longer recognize, you know, one of these protected classes to take it away. But you bring up a good point. Remember, and we all learned this in law school, whatever the federal government gives us as far as rights are concerned, our state and local jurisdictions, they can always give us more, but they can't take anything away. So those seven protected classes are true throughout the country. But depending on your state, you might actually have more protections. I know, for example, in the state of Florida, we still just have the seven protections. But in Alachua County, there's 13 protections. There's additional protections for um, uh, citizenship status, marital status, source of income. You know, there's an additional six protections. So your local ju jurisdiction can give you more, but they can't give you less or fewer than. Um, as far as having some of them taken away, I guess that would be by act of Congress. And then we have another question here. What was the, yeah, what was the name of the case? It's Reyes v. Waples. Um, I think it's like Waples Mobile Home Park or um, something like that. But Reyes v. Waples, that's the case we're keeping our eye on. It, it just, I believe it just moved up or I can't remember what sat, stage it's in regarding the Court of Appeals right now. But the lower court is the one that recognized um, you can't have one without the other, okay? Immigration, um, demanding immigration status proof is pretty much gonna always be national origin-based discrimination. And then just a side note on that case, the, the reason why the apartment community is trying to argue, oh, thank you so much. The reason why the apartment community is trying to argue we're allowed to ask this is that they're trying to make the argument that if we don't know the lawful immigration status of our tenants, we're at risk of, being, of violating immigration law. But the truth is that there's plenty of court cases that are already out there saying that it's not the job of the housing provider to keep their, uh, you know, aware of recent updates to immigration law, nor is renting a home to somebody considered harboring or smuggling somebody who's not supposed to be in the United States. There, there's just no precedence for saying that the landlord is liable um, to violating immigration law. Um, in addition to religion, uh, yes, there it is. Thank you so much for putting that in the chat. Um, uh, sex is protected. Um, sex includes not just gender, but as of February 2021, sex includes uh, gender identity and uh, sexual orientation. And we're we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, so I'll, I'll move on from there. Disability is probably the, it, not probably, it absolutely is the number one um, violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act. There are more complaints for disability-based denials of housing, denials of reasonable accommodations, denials of reasonable modifications than any other protected status. And then uh, families with children under the age of 18 is also protected. So those are the seven protections we have at the federal level. As I mentioned before, there are additional protections. This is just an example of Alachua, city of Gainesville. Sexual orientation, gender identity is actually written into the law. Um, victims of dating and domestic violence is written into the Alachua County uh, Ordinance for Protections of Housing. So you, uh, you just simply cannot directly discriminate against someone because they were the victim of dating or domestic violence or stalking um, in Alachua County. And in the city of Gainesville, we also have citizenship status, veteran status, and so forth. So that's just one example of one county in the state of Florida that does have additional protections. For the most part, um, every county might offer one or two additional protections. I know age is a common one that pops up throughout the state of Florida. And as you get into counties that have a little bit more of an urban um, demographic, so Miami-Dade, Orange County, um, you're going to see a few more protections linked to things like, uh, like, like Alachua does here. Um, they'll have sexual orientation written into it, possibly source of income. It really does depend on the county that you're looking at. So I think at this point, I'm going to pass it on to Erica and let her talk a little bit, and then I'm sure she'll pass it back to me. <laughs> thank you, Joe, and thank you, Alexis, for having us again. Um, my name is Erica Recheck, and I do uh, supervise the project here for uh, survivor advocacy, and I'm very privileged to work with a great, talented um, group of attorneys that advocate on various different areas of law. If you ever come across any housing issues, we are certainly ready and willing to um, take that on, and we're happy to present with you a little bit on that topic today. Um, as Joe just mentioned, sex is one of the protected classes under the Federal Fair Housing Act, and um, that's what I'll be speaking to you briefly. 
Because the overwhelming majority of domestic violence survivors and sexual assault victims are women, they are protected by the Federal Fair Housing Act's prohibition on sex discrimination. Um, the statistics here on at the statewide hotline at Florida Legal Services, we certainly recognize that survivors, we've certainly worked with male survivors, um, individuals that identify as male, but the reality is a lot and a high percentage of individuals that um, face domestic violence um, identify as women. And that is why the Fair Housing Act can certainly apply in the domestic violence situations and in the work that we see. So Joseph and I do get to overlap our work quite a bit here <laughs> at FLS. Under the Fair Housing Act, females and males are to be treated equally by all housing providers. You cannot discriminate based on sex, but you also um, similarly cannot treat a survivor of domestic violence any differently than you would a male, as we'll discuss in the next slide. Policies that appear neutral on its face but have negative impact on DV survivors because of its discriminatory effect on women are how the disparate impact can really come into play with domestic violence situations. The way that we see that a lot are women who are disproportionately affected by more, um, more than males um, with zero tolerance tolerance crime policies. Um, I don't know if in your work you may have seen any survivors who may come to you with any notices that say we are, we've received um, complaints about excessive noise coming from your unit or we've received complaints about um, a lot of police presence in your unit. And the reality is that domestic violence survivors should not be fearful of contacting law enforcement if they should need to do so. And then subsequently be impacted in their housing situation because of that call for help. Um, housing providers are expected to make exceptions to the zero tolerance crime policies for DV survivors to avoid any disparate impact on, on women and thereby having some sort of sex discrimination claim. Legal protections can apply when um, women are treated differently because of their survival status. Um, if a landlord evicts the female survivor of domestic violence but not the male partner, or a landlord evicts the female survivor because she called law enforcement, as I had just mentioned, um, discriminatory policies, um, I, I may have already mentioned a lot of this, but the landlord evicts the domestic violence survivor under the zero tolerance crime policy or nuisance. They evict the tenant due to repeated calls to police because of noise disturbances reported by other tenants. Or um, this may sound ludicrous, but if a landlord decides to charge um, someone who they have identified as a DV survivor, um, we've certainly have seen the screenings that have, um, have been done. And if a landlord comes across uh, any public records that show that there were injunctions or a criminal case um, that may have come up, um, we do see survivors who do get charged with, um, with crimes and then ultimately are found to be the victim of the crime and the charges are dropped. But a lot of these records can become part of public record. Um, when a landlord is screening someone, they certainly have access to any of those public records. So if they find that there is a history of domestic violence and then decide to charge a higher security deposit because there may be property damage later or they may have to break the lease and leave, all of those policies can certainly be um, discriminatory and something that should not be taking place. Um, I laugh because I, I've learned in the legal aid word, world not to be surprised. Um, I think yesterday I saw in the housing listserv that someone was um, describing a landlord who who placed um, notices and banners on um, a, a tenant that wasn't paying rent and basically advertising that this was a veteran who was disabled, who was not um, paying their rent on time and the fair housing alarms definitely go off and the fact that landlords still believe that they can certainly make violations um, and violate someone's rights are certainly um, are, are certainly shocking, but in our world we see some ludicrous facts and we are balancing the disbelief with also trying to advocate for the rights of the individuals. Um, but with that particular instance, that is something that, that I've seen in my practice where they do try to charge higher security deposits for an individual just because of their status as a DV survivor. Um, a landlord shouldn't be denying renting to a female survivor or evicting a survivor because the landlord thinks that the survival 
survivor is going to reconcile with their abuser. Um, Alexis, was there a question? No, someone rose their hand and I was making sure that they needed accommodations or they were okay. So, um, okay. We were good, so thank you. Okay. Though. All right, Joe, I think we can move to the next slide. Sex covers more than just gender. Sexual harassment, gender identity, and sexual orientation are protected classes under sex. The Fair Housing Act prohibits harassment in housing because of race, color, and national origin, religion, sex, disability, and family status. Um, we certainly um, we certainly don't want to see any harassment taking place because of any of these issues. And I think that this slide was leading into was the next slide the quid pro quo? Yes. <laughs> so um, with the sexual harassment, um, domestic violence survivors, they certainly can be in very vulnerable positions um, for various reasons. Sometimes there is a lot of financial um, dependence on the person who is their abuser. If they are in a very vulnerable position financially, um, it's not unheard of for a landlord to try to take advantage of that situation. And that's where some of these issues can come up with sexual harassment with quid pro quo. Any unwelcomed requests or demand that is made um, as a condition of accessing housing is a violation of the Fair, Fair Housing Act. It is illegal. Um, I know that years ago, the Department of Justice was having roundtables with um, the um, any attorneys in the in the area to certainly hear about any um, encounters that they were hearing with uh, landlords that were trying to take advantage or seek um, other types of payment from um, individuals who could not afford their rent. So if you are allowing to pay it, a tenant to pay their rent late in exchange for, let's say, a sexual favor, um, that is illegal. Waiving the security deposit because you'll make it up to the landlord in other manners, those actions are illegal. Uh, creating a hostile environment um, can be where the harassment is so severe and pervasive enough that it's interfering with the person's ability to access and live in housing. If the person is getting sexually harassed every time they try to access the, the laundry room um, or any time that they're just trying to go in the public common areas of the apartment complex, um, if a landlord and the staff are entering the apartment without notice um, and trying to um, catch you while you're showering, changing, not giving you the notice where you're adequately prepared for someone to enter your housing, that can be creating a hostile environment. Um, a, if a maintenance worker who's employed by a housing provider is subjecting a female tenant to pervasive harassment um, because of sexual orientation, that could certainly be an issue as well. Um, Alexis, I think you had a question. How is quid pro quo most commonly proved in these types of cases. I mean, there's certainly different avenues to, to pursue this. I know that Joe's project generally um, will go ahead and document the tenant's, um, the tenant's um, story, their narrative with respect to any sort of um, complaints that are filed with HUD. Um, and I can certainly let him speak more as to that. I think if there are any evictions, it could certainly be a defense that is raised if a tenant has finally taken a stand and now the landlord is trying to evict um, and you could raise retaliation as a defense if there was any sort of complaint filed. Um, if you could show that there was a repeated, if all of a sudden the tenant has now said no, and the landlord is now deciding to file a non-payment of rent action, but the landlord um, routinely did not pursue that claim, um, then there may be other arguments that could be raised, um, possibly a waiver argument, a latches argument, um, because they haven't pursued that non-payment of rent action before, and now all of a sudden, because the tenant said no, the, the client's testimony, the tenant's testimony is still something the court can consider. Did I? Okay, I answered that question. <laughs> um, and I think we can move to the next slide, Joe. Okay, yeah, and real quick, I think the next slide might be where I jump in again. Before we do that, I wanted to point everyone, I'm trying to look for the uh, citation it's, it's brand, it should have been brand new as far as um, kind of working its way through the appeals court. I'll just throw the name out there. There's a case, Fox v. Gaines, 
that's recent. In fact, I'm looking at the participant list of people who are on here today. Um, I'm seeing some folks that have a whole lot more experience and knowledge than I do. So feel free to jump in the chat box or unmute yourself if you want to make some comments. But the sexual harassment, um, uh, as far as being something that is, uh, uh, you know, so something you can sue under the Fair Housing Act, that's actually new to Florida. Uh, that's new to the 11th Circuit. Thank you to Fox v. Gaines, I, I believe. Um, and the idea being that uh, when a landlord basically says, I'm going to force a relationship upon the two of us in order for you to live here, and if you don't live up to that relationship, I'll be evicting you later. Everywhere else in the country has had it, except um, the 11th Circuit just got it about a month or two ago, um, as far as uh, it being a part of our enforcement of the Fair Housing Act. So as I mentioned before, the Fair Housing Act is not only a living document as far as Congress is concerned, it's a living document as far as how the courts are enforcing it, okay? So when we talk about questions regarding um, how do we prove this, how, how do we bring forth this, what, what are we arguing? You know, we, you, we have a good idea, but I guess you really never know what's going to stick. And the reason why I bring that up is that when we talk about sexual harassment, well, sex is a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. And you would think sexual harassment is going to be re uh, recognized as sexual based discrimination. I'm discriminating against you. I'm harassing you because of your gender. I wouldn't be doing it if you were a man. Or maybe I would. You know, how do I prove that? You kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Under the Fair Housing Act, there's also Section 818, which talks about retaliation, coercion, intimidation, and threats. Harassment might fall under there. So, so you're basically trying to say anything where I can point to how I'm being treated as a tenant, I'm going to find something in the law that allows me to kind of get through the door. So, um, and like I said, if there are some other folks on the call that maybe have a quick anecdote or something like that, or maybe you're nodding your head and you want to whisper something into the chat box, please throw it in there because I think we're all learning together, um, especially when it comes to sexual harassment in the 11th Circuit. So we have a question. Can landlord evict male or female arrest for domestic violence, whether ultimately convicted or not? If so, it could lead to eviction of victim and or children potentially for non-payment of rent if the abuser was primary income source. Any protections available? Great question. So if you're, if you're evicting someone because of the domestic violence and you're basically just saying, you know what, we're, we're tired of this. We want the whole family out. We, we don't want to know that he said, she said, we don't want to know the story. We're just basically saying y'all need to be out of here by the end of the week or, you know, we're, we're moving forward with the eviction or something like that. As Erica mentioned before, the more you have that policy and the more you implement that policy, the more you're going to be evicting women because women are more often than not on the receiving end of domestic violence. And so you're actually having a disparate impact discriminatory practice on women. So can you do it? Yeah, you can. Will it, will it work? Hopefully not. You know, ho hopefully someone stands up and says no, because the more you do it to me, the more you're doing it to others like me. And it just so happens we're all women. If the landlord is able to say, I'm not evicting you because of the domestic violence, I'm evicting you because it's been six weeks and you haven't paid rent. Now, now you have a different case on your hands. Now you have a failure to pay rent and that's gonna fall under landlord tenant law. You might be able to use discrimination in your defense to the eviction, but it's, it's not exactly clear that you can say it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act just yet. You're gonna need that evidence. Um, and Erica, did you have a comment too? Yeah, I was. I, I know that's the brief synopsis and I, I know as attorneys, we try to dissect every part and every yeah. little thing. Um, Whenever I'm getting a call or speaking with a client that has any type of similar issue, there, there's a lot of questions I want to ask is, are, are both parties on the lease? Is it just one party on the lease? Did the person who is the survivor, did they just recently move in? Did the landlord even know that they were there? Because I think all of those things are certainly going to impact the response. Um, if uh, the landlord is trying to evict um, someone who was arrested for domestic violence. Um, I think that if there are other supplementary filings, like, yes, they may have been arrested, but then the state is not prosecuting. And now that person has filed an injunction because they're fearful for their safety. I think all of that documentation can certainly help. There's, we're going to touch a little bit more on um, VAWA and the applications in subsidized housing a little bit later where you don't, there's no obligation to provide the documentation. But I've certainly found that if there's something in public record where I can say, if you pull this case and you can see the details and the narrative, this may help answer some of your questions. Um, 
I try to avoid <laughs> re-traumatizing a survivor that I'm working with because they're already dealing with so much. Um, I, I know we're hosting this um, training today um, with Alexis because of Fair Housing um, and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and the reality is with domestic violence, um, the analogy is always that it's an onion because you're peeling back layers. There's going to be first the violence. Is there going to be a criminal case? Does the person have to testify in a criminal proceeding? Are, are they being charged for something? And now there's an investigation where they may face criminal consequences. Housing is going to be up there, but sometimes it's not even the first thing that they're thinking about until they receive some sort of notice from the landlord. So can the land, to answer your question, I guess, because I'm sorry, I'm doing the lawyer thing where you answer a question with more questions. But um, basically, can the landlord provide a notice and say, has, there's been a violation of the lease, there's been criminal activity, and here's a seven day notice? They could. Um, there may be some defenses that could be raised in the actual eviction, and that, or you know, picking up a phone and calling the landlord's attorney and saying, hey, I, I just want to make sure you have all of the information because yes, from your perspective, this is what you've seen. There was criminal activity, there was an arrest, but I want to make sure you have all of the facts. It may very well be that the survivor, they may not even have a landlord tenant relationship with the um, with the landlord that's trying to pursue because they had no idea this person just moved in. And it, it can certainly be a, a balancing act for advocating for what rights the tenant has. Um, I think just recently in this past week, I was having this conversation with a tenant where I was telling them the plus is you're not liable for any rent that he's not paying because you never signed this lease. You were, you don't have a, that landlord tenant relationship. The, the bad side is, is that you also have a harder time in articulating your rights to occupancy. I mean, you have a right to occupy until there's a court order that says otherwise, but you can't say I have this lease and I have a right to stay until this date. So it may take a lot of advocacy if your tenant has the ability to continue paying the rent there. Can they assume the lease? Is there an order that says the other person cannot return? Can all the parties get on the same page? Um, so there can certainly be protections depending on the circumstances. And my curious mind would just want to know all of the facts to determine what, <laughs> how we can advocate for this tenant. And this but, it, and I would just want to add on to that exactly what you said, Erica, with, when we talk about case by case. Um, the direction we've been getting from HUD in regards to these no tolerance communities where they have the blanket rule that says any arrest record and, you know, we're not accepting your application for housing. Well, any arrest record really isn't a reflection of criminal activity and it's absolutely not a reflection of your you being a danger to the community. We can all get arrested for several different things and then let go five minutes later. The truth is, is if you're going through arrest records, it's going to be disparate impact on people of color and women. Those, those are the two protected classes that are going to have higher rates of arrest for things they never did in the first place. Okay. And, and that's more of a reflection of um, systemic racism and injustices that are prevalent throughout the country. So HUD is directing us to try to encourage housing providers to get rid of their no tolerance communities, their no tolerance policies. And we're even being directed further to say, it's not enough to just get rid of your no arrest records. You also need to get rid of your no felony records, because again, case by case basis, you might have someone with a felony who's not a danger to the community. I'll give a quick example. We do a lot of work with um, immigrant communities. In the state of Florida, it, it's against the law to drive without a license. So if you're in the state of Florida without proper documentation and you're just simply driving your kids to school and going to the grocery store, you're breaking the law. And if you do that three times, it's a felony. So then fast forward into the future, you are fortunate enough to benefit from uh, immigration status and now you have a lawful permanent residency and you're looking to move into a community or even you don't have your residency. You're gonna have a felony on your background but you're not the person that the apartment community is trying to prevent living there due to safety concerns. So felonies need to be looked at on a case by case basis anyways because not all felonies are the same. And that definitely bleeds into the concept of domestic violence and eviction records and case by case and criminal records. Because just as Erica said, if the landlord or the housing provider actually looks into a little bit of the story without digging and, you know, like Erica said, making them relive the experience, but just simply asking some basic questions, they're going to learn. You're not the person we're trying to prevent from living here. So HUD has been giving us direction to really encourage housing providers to get rid of these blanket rules and just move forward with a case by case policy. 
And I will say too, I'm always curious as to who the landlord is because, and the reason I say that is, I feel like Florida is always a little slower in catching up to the rest of the country. And I think all of my, all the attorneys, especially in the legal aid world would, would agree with that. Um, and I know that sometimes if it is an apartment complex that's part of a larger corporation where they have presence in other states or their base is somewhere else, they already may have been forward thinking about some of the policies that they have internally of how they deal with the domestic violence situations. We've certainly had success with that too. So even if it's not a situation where there are um, sub subsidized housing protections under the Violence Against Women Act, then there, that company itself may also have protections of how they address situations where there is domestic violence, where someone was arrested, but they may have ultimately been convicted or not. I, I always like that, um, that defense that you could raise of equity abhors a forfeiture. And that is, that's old school language, but I love that language because you should be exploring every other method or option before, alternative, that's the word I was thinking of, before proceeding with that eviction, especially if you're dealing with a domestic violence survivor who is already encountering so many other issues. And I think once landlords understand, or if the landlord itself doesn't, themselves don't understand, hopefully the attorney has a has a heart somewhere in there <laughs> and they, they don't necessarily wanna be putting this evidence in front of a judge anyway. So um, I think you can usually try to avoid any type of eviction or at least postpone and say, yes, there's been an arrest going back to the question. Sorry if we, we trailed off a little bit, but um, you can explore those options say, you know, there is still an open case, but these are the underlying facts. There's also an injunction. We are working with a domestic violence center. We are just trying to avoid an eviction and avoid more trauma for this family. And hopefully you can there may be other things in place that are keeping the abuser from returning back to the residence, such as a no contact order or an injunction. And hopefully that housing can at least be extended until other solutions can be met. Right. So let's talk a little bit about this case we mentioned earlier. It's not specific to domestic violence, but it definitely relates to sex-based um, discrimination under the Fair Housing Act and really every administrative um, enforced law in the United States. So Bostock versus Clayton County, this was a case that came up in the summer of 2020. It was an employment-based case that the Supreme Court reviewed and uh, uh, provided opinion for. And it analyzed what protections are encompassed under Title VII discrimination on the basis of sex. And the court determined that sex-based discrimination encompasses gender identity and sexual orientation. The very basic legal reasoning, I, I, I'm assuming at this point, many of us on the call already know about Bostock versus Clayton County, but uh, Supreme Court Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion and simply said, if I'm an employer and I allow a female employee to go home into a loving relationship with a man, and I have, I'm an employer and I have a male employee and I do not let him go home to a loving relationship with a man, I'm letting the female employee do something I'm not letting the male employee do. do. That's sex-based discrimination. So anytime you have sexual orientation based discrimination, it is sex based discrimination. And so the, what the federal government did after that was it took that legal reasoning and it sprinkled it throughout um, all the agencies and all the laws in relationship to um, civil rights and um, discrimination based protections. And so the Fair Housing Act, um, uh, HUD came out with a memo in February 2021 that basically said the Fair Housing Act is not going to expand its seven protected classes. It still just has the seven, but underneath sex, sexual orientation and gender identity is protected and it will be enforced. And so how does this relate to um, uh, domestic violence and LGBTQ membership so if a tenant is evicted after the landlord discovers the tenant dates persons of the same sex and identifies as bisexual, that's, that, that's going to be discrimination. If a same-sex couple asks to see a unit throughout the city, but the agent only shows the couple units in a part of the city known to have many LGBTQ residents, that would be steering based on LGBTQ membership. Uh, that would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. And let's say a building manager refuses to authorize repairs to a tenant's unit after observing the tenant's teenage daughter holding hands with her girlfriend. The manager explained that he does not agree with the teenager's homosexual lifestyle and that the tenant will need to make the repairs himself. That's a violation because remember under the Fair Housing Act, anybody in the household is protected. Okay, so you cannot use somebody's household protected class against um, the, the person who actually has their name on the lease. Um, 
So I believe when we talk about identifying housing discrimination, so this is an important concept to remember specific to the Fair Housing Act is that you have to have that nexus, okay? So how are your fair housing rights uh, uh, being violated and what's the protected class? So you can't say, I didn't pay rent for three months and I'm a person of color. Well, you're not immune. There has to be the overlap. There has to be the intersection, okay? And remember under the protected classes, all classes are protected as far as all races, all colors, all religions, all national origins. It's not just minority status or it's not just uh, whatever the statistical minority might be in this country at the current time, that's what's protected. It's everybody at all times. So whatever you are can never be used against you. And it has to have that because of nexus. It's not, I lost my housing and I have a disability. It's I lost my housing because I have a disability. So we're gonna talk, um, we're gonna go through some of these cases specific to um, some domestic violence situations that we may um, see. So Elena lost her job and has not been able to pay her rent for two months. Her landlord, Stephen, has been very nice to her and understands her situation and has let her stay in the apartment anyways. She wants to make it up to him and knows that he has always had a crush on her. She agrees to go out with him and they start dating. About six months later, she has been able to catch up on the rent and is no longer behind. However, she no longer wishes to pursue a relationship with Stephen and tells him she is breaking up with him. Stephen gets upset and serves her with an eviction notice. So can he do this? What defenses does Elena have to the eviction? And what will Stephen try to argue? So I'd love to open it up, um, chat box, or I guess if you have the opportunity to unmute yourself, maybe we can kind of discuss some of these little questions at the end there. Can he do this? What defenses does she have? And what will he try to argue? And let's even think outside the box regarding just simple um, sexual harassment-based Fair Housing Act. Is she the victim of domestic violence in this particular scenario? And if so, how? And folks don't have the ability to unmute. Oh, okay. So, phone. but it's okay if if somebody <laughs> needs an accommodation, please just raise your hand, and I'll I'll do it for you. Okay. So we have a first comment. So yeah, I love this. So Stephen's going to argue. No, this wasn't quid pro quo because it was welcome. Okay. Um, and I love that comment because what we have to remember, and I, I get this sometimes from housing providers, not because they're trying to be stubborn, but they're just genuinely, you know, um, uh, innocent ignorance to why, <laughs> why would this be, you know, on him? And the answer is that even though it might have been a mutual, you know, discussion at the beginning, you know, he didn't necessarily force it, he just presented it as an option, he got a benefit, she got a benefit. So, you know, maybe it really wasn't that bad of a deal. But remember, at any time he's not happy with the situation, he gets to deny her housing. So there's that power dynamic. If at any time she's unhappy with the relationship, she just simply breaks it off with him and you know she doesn't have any power over him. He's got the power over her. So his argument will likely fail because of that power dynamic. What else? Let me throw this out there. Is Elena the victim of domestic violence in this situation? And if so, how? I know, Eric, Eric you're, you're more the expert. I'd love to hear your answer. I'm going to throw out a quick answer. I'm going to say I'd make the argument that she is because it's, it's financial abuse. It's, it's some sort of relationship. Now, they might not be married. They might not be living together or something like that. So it might be a little bit of a stretch as far as, you know, your, your common case argument. But he's using his power against her to force her to either be homeless or be with him. What do you think, Erica? <laughs> um, I think that it's one of those a yeah. trickier and harder situation yeah. that sometimes <laughs> when we're having the conversations because when you're talking about domestic violence there's definitely power and control um, um, issues that you need to evaluate and there are different types of abuse um, emotional abuse verbal abuse physical abuse financial abuse but unfortunately there are only certain types of abuse that you can actually use to support an injunction you can always file the likelihood of a court granting you any type of injunction, whether it's for domestic violence. Here, it doesn't sound like they've lived together, so I probably would not right. be encouraging a domestic violence injunction. Um, if it was an issue of dating violence, if there were other, you know, why is she breaking up with him? Is he making threats against her? Or is it just really that she wanted the relationship to be over? Is he continuously stalking her? There, there may be questions to be asked and other options for her to pursue, but 
generally speaking, if it's right. just the filing of the eviction, um, that by itself would probably right. not get her very far if she was trying to pursue any type of claim for um, a domestic violence injunction. But I think that's one of the harder parts of our job is to tell someone you're experiencing these real issues with this abusive person, but it's like they know Mm -hmm. how to pursue that abuse to the point that you have limited options to pursue some type of protection against them. And those are, I, I mean, I don't want to say that it's worse, but it, it's, it's terrible to feel powerless. Like you can't take those steps to, to seek yeah. that protection. And, and, and yeah. And so we have a comment from the Kia saying it doesn't meet the legal definition of domestic violence in Florida. Yeah, that, that's true. It, the, the elements aren't, aren't met every single step of the way. Um, and the reason why I want to make sure we kind of point out is that a lot of times when clients call us up or they bring their story in their mind, they don't know what the protection is. Am I the victim of domestic violence? And if I'm not, does that mean I just have to accept it? Well, that's why we try to have these presentations and talk about the overlap. So the Fair Housing Act is what's going to step in and protect her because this is a violation of sexual harassment and housing laws. OK, the Federal Fair Housing Act. So while, yes, she might not be the victim of domestic violence, it's still going to be a violation of her fair housing rights. And if she doesn't know that, or if the people advocating for her don't know that, she's going to end up having to shrug her shoulders and say, if it doesn't meet the elements of DV, then I guess I don't have anywhere to go. So it's our job to make sure that we do the correct issue spotting and find what, ex what law is actually being violated here. And I think you're right, William, um, from looking at your chat. I mean, you definitely want to scrutinize that notice. What is the basis? Is there... A is it a month-to-month -month lease that's taking place now? Are they now in the jurisdiction where you need 60 days notice instead of just the 15 days per the statute? Or is it that, you know, I, I've spoken to someone recently where now all of a sudden the person who's a survivor now all of a sudden owes about six months of rent that was never requested before. <laughs> like, where did this rent come from? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think that you want to scrutinize a notice, see what defenses there are. Are they current? Did they cure? Are they now trying to use like all of the late fees? And so, yes, I, I agree. You want to, you want to take out your fine tooth comb and make sure that you're not missing anything in the notice, anything in the lease. And it might be a very good one to also say motion to dismiss because they're, they're current. Um, there, right. there is nothing here. Or even in the sense that, yes, I gave you the 60 days notice and you're out of here and I lawfully terminated or chose not to renew the lease. But if there's an exchange of text messages that shows it's retaliation, you know, if, there, if there's some sort of text message where he says, break up with me, well, then I'm going to give you your 60 day notice tomorrow. Screenshot that text message <laughs> because, you know, that's him saying I'm retaliating against you, you know, and that, that might be the proof that's needed. So he's going to have all the arguments in the world that he followed what he needed to do. But if there's proof that he did it from a place of harassment, retaliation, coercion, intimidation, you still might have something as far as the defense goes. Um, and the key, I like your comment here. Any defense would depend on how she caught up on rent. Did he forgive past rent because of the relationship over time or did she actually pay it over time? Exactly. You, you, both sides are going to be bringing to the table. You know, Stephen's going to say, hey, she owed this much money and I never got that much money. So she's late on rent. Whereas she's going to then have to say, well, there's a reason why I didn't give him money. And it's because, you know, how do you prove that? How, how do you prove that was the relationship? And not only did he accept this in exchange for money, but he also forced it upon me. You know, I tried to pay the rent, but he said, no, I'd rather have this, you know, something like that. So let's do the second one. Um, Eric, I'll let you talk for a little bit. Why don't you take this one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and, and I just want to preface this by saying there may be other options once we cover some of the slides later on too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Martha and Aubrey have been in a relationship for two years. Martha recently lost her job and began physically abusing Aubrey as the stress had begun to worsen. The other night, Martha threw a plate at Aubrey and it barely missed her and broke the glass window and landed in the bushes in front of their apartment. Aubrey called 911 and locked herself in the bathroom while she waited. Police came and took Martha away. The next morning, the landlord knocked on the door and provided Aubrey with the termination of tenancy notice. What else do we need to know about this situation and can the landlord evict Aubrey? And I'll give you a moment to add any comments in the chat. Yeah, so Carlene says lease term, payment history. And not only lease term, but who, whose name is on the lease, right? 
that's going to that's going to be a big one. Aubrey might be pleading to the landlord saying, you got to let me stay. I was the victim. And the landlord could say, I don't have a contract with you. I have the contract with Martha. Her name's on the lease. Yes. So I would want to know exactly what you mentioned, the lease term, any payment history. I have a feeling this termination notice is probably not necessarily related to non-payment of rent, but rather the criminal act because law enforcement was there to take somebody away. Um, I will say that one of my first questions when I'm usually speaking to someone is who is your landlord and do you receive any sort of federal assistance for this type of housing? And the reason I mentioned you may have other ideas after um, the other slides in just a moment, um, it, it is because there are gonna be more options available if a person is living in any type of subsidized housing. Um, as for can the landlord evict Aubrey, I think that depends. Um, is there a lease with Aubrey who is on the lease? Um, what is the basis for the termination? Are, are there other issues we don't know about? Because um, I don't know if I've heard Joe say it today, but I know I've heard him say it before. The Fair Housing Act doesn't protect you from everything. If no. you could fall under a protected class, but you could also violate your lease and there may be violations for which a landlord can certainly take action regardless of your status in any of the protected classes and taking action that is allowed under the law is not discrimination so I, I think a lot of it depends and, and I'll throw this out there and I think we might have some slides later on that discuss this but let's say Martha and Aubrey both their names are on the lease can Aubrey ask the landlord can you just evict Martha but let me stay why and why not could the, what, i mean the landlord might put their hands in the air and say i don't know what 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 can and can't the landlord do in that situation i mean i think a, a lot of the questions come down to you know like you said who's on the lease can we switch over the lease can we remove someone from the lease what is the can someone afford the payment on their own i think you know we work in legal aid where a lot of our clients are not don't have the luxury of having a lot of resources and they may not be able to afford this tenancy on their own. If they can, if they can switch over the lease to their name, if all the parties consent. I, I mean, to me, if someone has been arrested, there's probably a no contact order that says the person cannot return back to the premises. So that can sometimes help ease the concern of a landlord who says, is this person gonna come back? Are they a threat to other people? Um, I think that taking that into consideration, if there are other court orders that could be sought, such as an injunction for protection against domestic violence, um, if the person can afford the lease, and if the other person can't afford, can't return legally, why would they want their name to continue on the lease? They should be willing to sign something that removes them from the lease, and the landlord should be able to just proceed with transferring it over. It might be that no one can live there anymore because the survivor can no longer afford the rent there on their own. And the other person is, you know, not able to return, return, not wanting to return. So we may have to evaluate what other options exist to not make the survivor immediately homeless while at the same time, not having them incur financial liability that they can't continue affording. So, I mean, if it needs to be something where the person is removed from the lease, we explore those options. We can certainly try to do that. Um, well, and I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please, go ahead. I, I was just going to say one of the things that we didn't really address through the presentation, but I think comes up as part of the um, domestic violence and the survivors that you're working with is the trauma that they've experienced. Yeah. It, it's not something that just goes away. It, it's not something that it happened to yesterday. I'm a new person today. I'm all good. <laughs> That's not the reality. Um, there's a lot of long-term trauma that results from this, and you have no idea how long the survivor has been uh, going through any of these issues with this individual. Sometimes it I, I speak to clients who say, I've been going through this for the 10 years in our relationship and I finally took a stand. There may be a lot going on there and there may be some um, related you know, mental health counseling that they're gonna need to seek out. There might be some post-traumatic stress disorders that they're facing. Coming back to the unit where the abuse happened, it may be extremely traumatizing and it may be a very good basis to ask for a reasonable accommodation to terminate that lease, get your name off of the lease, because I cannot physically come back here without having a panic attack. Right. I, I've spoken to those clients and 
Um, I know we were we were trying to fit in as much as we could <laughs> within the presentation, but I just wanted to make that point because I, I think all of those questions are very important. If you're working with a survivor, you don't want to overlook some of the those topics. Um, and I, you know, it is a very personal question. And when I ask someone, I, I always preface it with why I'm asking, but I yeah. want to make sure that they're connected to resources. But I also asked just because it could be relevant to, to your housing case, have, have you sought any counseling? Are you, have there been any diagnoses um, that yeah. have resulted from this? Because not all of the injuries are, are physically invisible. Um, you, you may have a lot of injuries in front of you that are someone is facing internally and you have no idea. Um, and, and I love that you bring that up because I'm sure many of us listening in right now, ourselves included, if we get a, a call from someone about, you know, my landlord said no to my emotional sport animal and we get a little bit deeper into their case, it's because five years ago they were the victims of domestic violence and that, re, you know, that, that then lend itself to having PTSD, panic attacks, anxiety, and stuff like that. So the DV survivor status, it stays with you. And the Fair Housing Act might be protecting you later on for a different reason, but it's still linked to that experience. So like Erica said, now it's a disability-based accommodation that we're looking at. So the, the issue spotting really comes into play even five, six, seven years down the road. Um, and I want to point to Lakia's comment, very simple question, but this is the question we need to ask. What was the reason for the termination? If we really look at these, if this was the entire hypothetical provided on a, a law school final exam, Aubrey called 911 and locked herself in the bathroom while she waited. Not one of those actions is a violation of the law. <laughs> Not one of those actions, I assume, is a violation of a lease. I don't know any lease that ever has something that says you're never allowed to call 911, lock yourself in the bathroom and wait. <laughs> if, if you have a lease that says that, don't sign it. You know, you're signing away your rights to safety. So really, what is the reason for evicting Aubrey? The, the, the landlord has to have a reason. And if it's provided with a seven day notice to cure, is it something you can cure? If it's not something you can cure, you need to look at, well, if I can't cure it, did I even do it in the first place? Did I actually even violate the lease? So a lot of times landlords do just throw their arms and say, that's it, you're both out of here. It's not that easy, landlord. <laughs> you actually have to say why. Well, what is the reason for terminating? I was just speaking to um, another other attorneys earlier this week about how you have a right to having a specific notice. You have a right to know why it can't just be for that thing that happened the other day. It has to be specific. Give me the date, give me the actions. What happened? Um, because yeah, if a landlord is then filing the actual eviction based on reasons not in the notice of termination, you have some defenses there. So I, I really could keep deviating into different topics. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> no, no, let's, let's do this next one here. I'll, I'll read this one. So Samantha identifies internally as LGBTQ, but is currently in a heterosexual relationship. She recently revealed to her boyfriend, Peter, that she identifies as lesbian and wanted to break up. Peter did not respond well and began to abuse her and ridicule her, insisting that she didn't know what she was talking about. He began to belittle her and force her into a situation she didn't want to be in. Otherwise, he would reveal publicly what she told him privately. One day, he forced her to commit a crime, and she felt compelled to follow his directions. She was caught, but luckily had the charges dropped. She now has an arrest record. And I know we haven't talked fully about VAWA yet, but let's, this is kind of our intro into the VAWA next slides. How can VAWA protect her and what can she say to a future landlord who sees that she has an arrest record? And you know, we're, we're gonna talk about this for in the next few slides about VAWA, but any ideas in the chat box as far as her charges were dropped and she you know, was arrested because she was coerced into doing the crime from her boyfriend. Is, is she protected? Is there anything that she can do? thoughts the, I mean the, the very basics I would say to this is that again it goes back to oops this um, case by case basis you don't want the survivor to relive the situation but there might be a situation for in order for her to exercise her rights she does have to ask the landlord can I just at least share a little bit of my story with you so that on a case by case basis you can recognize that I'm not the person you're trying to prevent from living in your community um, so a lot of times advocacy and legal assistance comes in the form of helping them shape their story so that they feel comfortable sharing what needs to be shared and it's going to be effective without, you know, leading to their own anxiety or leading to more information being provided that the landlord actually needs. Um, do you have any other comments on this one, Erica, or should we move into the VAWA slides? We can move into the VAWA okay. slides. I know we're running a little. All right. I'll hand this over to you. 
Um, so we've always had the Violence Against Women Act um, and the Reauthorization Act, excuse me. Um, the last one that you may have been familiar with was in 2013, but it was reauthorized, VAWA 2022, which does um, provide similar protections for domestic violence survivors, date, survivors of dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking who are seeking to access or maintain federally subsidized housing. Um, there are same safeguards are there I've added in some slides. I just wanted to make sure um, you were aware of any expansions to the housing protections that were available. VAWA protects female and male survivors of domestic violence, um, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Any immediate family of the survivor and any members of the survivor's household should also be protected. Um, it protects survivors on tribal lands as well as LGBTQ and immigrant victims as well. Um, this first slide has the um, what types of housing VAWA covers. The next slide um, does have some additional um, housing that where the expansion really came in. But um, if anyone, just to briefly um, cover them, I'm not sure if our attendance here is um, housing attorneys, but I know a lot, some attorneys may only do just private landlord tenant issues and not really do a lot of the um, subsidized housing. If there's a housing authority involved, that's going to be likely public housing or they're administering a Section 8 voucher. Um, a Section 8 voucher is something that where they may have a private landlord, but that's where it's important to not just ask who the landlord is, but also who pays their rent. Um, because it may be that the housing authority may have a separate agreement with the landlord to cover the majority of the rent for that tenant and the tenant may just be paying a small portion based on their um, on their income and any calculations done with their household. Um, I would say rent is ridiculously high. So if someone is telling you that they pay a, a cost that doesn't sound like very much, um, it's very possible that there is some type of subsidy. So I would certainly recommend doing a little bit of digging. Um, I like to look up properties on the Schimberg site, which um, I probably should have put in the slides, but it's the University of Florida um, Schimberg site where um, you can look up by county the um, any subsidized housing. So if you're curious if there's a property that is low income tax credit that's um, last on this list, um, there may be some additional protections that are available for that survivor. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Joe. Um, but new programs were added with FAWA 2022 to include transitional housing assistance for homeless veterans, grant programs for homeless veterans with special needs, um, supportive services for veteran families, veteran affairs, supportive housing, the VASH program, National Housing Trust Fund, and transitional housing assistance grants for victims. I think that was supposed to be an of, that's on me, <laughs> domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, there is an additional catch-all provision to include any other federal housing programs providing affordable housing to low and moderate income persons by means of restricted rents or rental assistance, or more generally providing affordable housing opportunities as identified by the appropriate agency through regulations, notices, and any other means. So it, it, there are efforts for there to be more inclusion with what is covered under the Violence Against Women Act and the, what might trigger some additional notices and protections. Um, I know in reading um, some of the changes, there should be um, individuals within HUD that are there to um, specifically make sure that each program has someone who is working to implement any follow-up protections within the, the housing programs as well. And I saw Alexis added the Schimberg um, page on the list. So thank you, Alexis. We can go to the next slide, Joe. Um, so when residing in any housing that is subject to the VAWA protections, the survivor shouldn't be denied admission or be evicted or have assistance terminated on the basis or as a direct result of the victimization. So while there may, may be some advocacy available, as Joe mentioned earlier, when someone is being turned down for housing because of a past criminal history, Anytime there is um, subsidized housing involved, um, at least with public housing, Section 8 vouchers, you, you should still have the right to some type of administrative hearing if you are being denied that housing. You should have an opportunity to be heard as to why 
something may have happened. You have an eviction on your record. You had to flee because of domestic violence. You had no idea that there was a resulting eviction on your record because that eviction was done by posting. It was posted on the door of a residence you were no longer at. And now you have this on your record, but you were fleeing a domestic violence situation. That's just an example, but that may be an opportunity for you to um, use the VAWA um, Reauthorization Act to advocate and still try to not be denied that housing. Um, if you have poor credit history because someone opened accounts under your name, and um, of course, that could be a whole nother training. Um, that should be a, a something that um, you can certainly explain and not be denied housing for. Um, but VAWA also allows you to have other protections. Um, there is a VAWA self-certification form if you are um, and a notice that's provided that tells you, um, you know, when this should be used and it allows you to provide some information that self-certification -certi form should allow you to provide the information that your landlords need if you're in a situation where now I'm about to get evicted and because I've gotten this notice, but you have no idea all of the facts with this, um, I need to explain to you what has happened. I should be able to just tell you some brief information. I shouldn't have to be re-traumatized. I shouldn't have to provide you all these documents. But again, these additional protections do come about with the federally subsidized um, housing. Um, information that is submitted in this documentation should be maintained in strict confidence. Um, it should only be accessed by, if explicitly authorized. It shouldn't be in a shared database where every employee in that agency has access to. Um, it could trigger some limited releases of you know, how long um, some information may be valid for, um, but it, it should still be maintained in confidence because um, sometimes when you're working with survivors, they, they certainly may not want someone to know where they are either. <laughs> so you want to avoid any um, disclosure of their residence, their full name within um, with any of these databases that may exist for the housing providers. And I'm sorry, I, kn I know I'm kind of covering things a little fast, but I know we spent a lot of time earlier. <laughs> so um, afterwards, we can certainly um, share email and I'm happy to be available afterwards as well. Um, when residing in housing subject to VAWA protections, a survivor can request relief, such as the abuser being removed from the housing, being provided time to establish eligibility for the housing program. So let's say a voucher or um, something was only under one individual's name, the survivor should be given time to submit their own application to be eligible to be the primary person. They could try to bifurcate the lease. So yeah, bifurcate it. If you want to terminate the abuser, that's fine, but I'd like to qualify for continuing to rent here with my, my children, or I'd like an emergency transfer. Um, I would like to be transferred to another unit, or if I have a voucher, maybe transferred to another jurisdiction because I'm trying to flee my abuser. So there really shouldn't be, um, there should be an incentive and protections with VAWA to get the ball moving somewhat quickly. So that way you're not um, having to stay in an unsafe situation or face eviction. Um, an incident of abuse is not serious or a repeated lease violation by the victim survivor for termination. And this is kind of what I was mentioning earlier. If a housing provider can demonstrate actual or imminent or an imminent threat, it can get a little bit more complicated, but the eviction should not happen unless there's no other action that would eliminate or reduce the, the alleged threat. So, um, but an incident of abuse, as Joe was mentioning, there, there's no lease provision that says you cannot call police, that you cannot hide in a room until law enforcement arrives. Um, you should not be penalized for your abuser breaking the window, um, but, one incentive of abuse is not a serious or repeated lease violation for which the survivor should be facing that eviction. And I saw we had a question coming Yeah, up. we have a question. I'll read it out loud. Does the abuser need to be arrested or convicted for VAWA to come in play, or is it just based on victim's good faith work? You don't need the arrest or the conviction. And again, there shouldn't be a requirement. Like the, the VAWA self-certification form, which I can look up here, um, it should provide the landlord with enough information. Obviously, if there are situations where it might be one person's word against the other word, so that the other person's word. Um, so then at that point, it is possible that a landlord may ask for some additional supplementary information. So if there is any helpful information like a police report or an injunction that was filed or anything else, um, it can certainly be utilized. 
you don't need the arrest or the conviction though, if they're trying to go ahead and terminate you. Sometimes law enforcement was not involved, but maybe they're trying to terminate because of repeated noise violations. They gave you the one seven day notice and now there's still been continued loud noises coming from the unit, um, loud disturbances that other neighbors are complaining about. And now this is a second notice that you're receiving. Now they might be trying to proceed with other types of action. And if it's something where there is subsidized housing involved, there should be additional protections. A self-certification form can be something that can be provided, um, but it, it's not necessary for there to be an arrest or a conviction. Obviously, if any of that has happened, it's going to be helpful for the person, but that, that's not necessary. Well, and, and I want to throw this out, this scenario out there that I, I know I've heard a few times, and I'm sure people uh, uh, participating or attending today have heard this too. We, you know, the story of the person who calls 911, locks himself in the bathroom and waits for the police. A lot of the times they're the ones who get arrested because they're the ones who talk to the police second. The person who talked to the police first is the abuser who's waiting on the front lawn. The police show up and it's the abuser who gets the first chance to speak to the police and say their side of the story. So would the police believe the first thing they hear, they go inside the house and they arrest the person who actually called 911. I mean, in that scenario, yeah. I mean, how are you going to be able to move forward with a, a track record or, or a paper trail that actually shows you're the one who got arrested and you're the one who, you know, they believe the other side first. So just like Erica said, yeah, a police report that shows you are the victim will absolutely help. But it's not necessary because, as we all know, police can get it wrong. You know, the, the story, the written story could actually be wrong now and then. So sometimes on a case by case basis, you just need to come forward and say, this is the actual thing that happened, you know, something like that. And I just added the, um, the link to the uh, had the self-certification form. Um, you'll see if you click on that, the first page does have just the explanation for the purpose of the form. The, generally, if something is happening where the landlord knows, I, I've seen it where you, you get that when you sign your lease, you get like the whole packet and the additional protections, notices that have to be provided when you're signing your lease. But if some triggering action is happening, I, I think landlords also have an idea of when this may involve domestic violence too. Um, they they should be providing this with the notice because you can self-certify and say, well, no, yes, I, I understand you're giving me this notice, <laughs> but here's some more information that they may be, may be helpful in the situation. Um, I've certainly had cases where my client was a what form are you talking about and you know we can certainly submit it and um, if they are asking for any additional information if it does happen to be a situation where both parties are you know reporting against each other um, it the tenant should be given the opportunity to provide supplemental information it shouldn't be something that requires an immediate um, action by the landlord. And I think this was you, Joe, right? Yeah. So, and I think we really even already covered some of this. So um, the landlord is not supposed to use adverse factors against the survivor. So like Eric mentioned, you might have poor credit history because of the abuse. The abuse might've been financial abuse and that's what you, you're, you're suffering from. And that's what you're, you're the survivor of. It's not supposed to be used against you. Your poor rental history, you might've been evicted because you were the victim of domestic violence. It's not supposed to be used against you. And again, other types of criminal history where you were coerced into participating in the crime, the charges were dropped against you. And it was proven that, you know, your crime is a direct link to being the victim of domestic violence or a survivor thereof. Uh, it's not supposed to be used against you. So we're, we're going to round out this presentation today with just kind of a discussion of how do you take action. So if, if you think that there's a fair housing violation that has occurred um, based on any one of the seven protected classes or possibly even disparate impact, although that's going to be a little bit harder to put together, there's more legwork on those ones. But the, the, the first idea is that you file an administrative complaint to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. You're also able to file a direct complaint to a Fair Housing Assistance Program or a FAP. In the state of Florida, we have the Florida Commission on Human Relations, which is statewide. And then we also have five other local FAPs, um, Broward County, the city of Orlando, Jacksonville, Palm Beach, Pinellas, and city of Tampa. Although it's been recommended to me, and I think the person who recommended it to me is on the call, and thank you for that recommendation, file your complaints to HUD directly, and then HUD will pass it down the line as they see fit. It's just nice to have that trail that HUD is aware of the situation, because a lot of times if HUD sees the case and they want to take it, 
that, that you're, you're, you're better off with HUD saying, we're going to go ahead and take this one ourselves. Um, and if they say we're going to pass it down the line, that's great because now there's a little bit of a history of your complaint being seen in front of all these different offices. Um, but if you live in one of these local jurisdictions and maybe you have a good relationship and you, you know the staff, definitely file directly to them. Um, sometimes that can definitely be quicker. You're also able to file a direct lawsuit in state or federal court based on fair housing violations. Unlike other um, civil right protections, the Fair Housing Act does not require that you exhaust all administrative remedies before filing a, a civil lawsuit. Now, if you're going to file an administrative complaint directly to HUD or with a FAP, you have one year since the date of the last occurrence. And if you're going to file a, a lawsuit directly, depending on the jurisdiction, but you have two years, depending on if you're filing under a state Fair Housing Act or the Federal Fair Housing Act, you, typically you're looking at two years, again, depending on that jurisdiction. However, if you file an administrative complaint, it's going to toll the two years. So the moment you file that administrative complaint, the clock stops on your two-year ability to file that lawsuit. And also one other thing that can happen where they go together is if you file an administrative complaint and the administrative investigation does turn, turn up cause for discrimination, you can take that investigation or the completed investigation, remove it from an administrative court and take it to a civil court. Um, but you can't do both at the same time. Once you enter the courtroom in one side, you have to pick which side, which path you're headed on. Um, and then I did want to mention, um, and Eric, I'll let you add some more notes. If you're filing any sort of taking action under violations of VAWA, my advice right away, very simple. I always ask clients right away, if you feel your rights under VAWA have been violated, were you ever provided notice? And I know Erica mentioned this before, but that's kind of the big thing right away is that um, uh, federally subsidized housing, they're, they're supposed to be providing notice constantly about your rights under VAWA. So anytime there is a DV incident, um, anytime you move in, anytime you renew your lease, you know, anytime there's something going on with your housing, they're supposed to be providing you with notice of your rights under VAWA. If they're not providing you notice and they're still trying to evict you, you have a right to come forward and say, you were supposed to provide me with my notice of my rights before doing this anyways. Is that going to be your full defense and you're good? Probably not, but that's that's the first step I always encourage people to take and making sure that they know their rights. And Erica, I'll let you mention if you have any advice for taking action under VAWA. Uh, I mean, I, I think just, I think it applies to a lot of different things of don't delay in taking action. I know our tenants are, um, I, I think sometimes in just as human nature, we like to put our blinders on, especially if we're dealing with a lot of overwhelming things going on at the same time and don't ignore any notices. Um, definitely take your tenants to, you know, bring any notices. If you get that, um, any sort of eviction action, everything happens really quickly. So if you want to assert any rights or provide any supplemental information to your housing provider, I mean, with some subsidized housing would be a whole nother training, but each program is different. Some of them you do have um, an opportunity to have a grievance hearing. Some of the programs that are covered under VAWA, they don't necessarily have the administrative hearing process. Everything will be initiated with the courts um, to start the process after the termination notice. So it, it really depends on the program. If you have questions or if it's, you know, something specific about the, how the subsidized housing program works, um, that green book is invaluable <laughs> um, or, you know, send them our way. We do have our information further down. So I, I do like the subsidized housing work and, and happy to take a look with you um, to see what may be available. But yes, any, did the tenant miss any deadlines with respect to um, requesting any sort of grievance or filing for an administrative hearing? Um, are there any notices? Can we still provide that HUD um, form to ask for any, um, any accommodation, not necessarily accommodations, but any options under VAWA, whether it's emergency transfer or time to qualify for the, the tenancy on their own. So um, definitely don't delay in taking action. And I know everything is overwhelming for the survivors. So that's why they, they need us to be there <laughs> to, to take a look for them. And that's the last slide, act early, don't wait. Um... That's the name of the game. You obviously don't want to pressure people to relive something so soon right afterwards. But the statute of limitations will, will run out under certain housing rights and being able to exercise those rights. So um, act early and, and don't wait if you can. 
So that kind of takes us to the, it does take us to the end of our presentation. I think we have five minutes till the, uh, our time is up. So if there's any questions, feel free to jump them in the chat box. And I know Alexis has some words for us as well. Yep, sure do. Um, so folks, while I'm doing these last minute announcements, please feel free to drop um, you know, any last minute questions you might have into the chat. I'm also happy to share um, you know, Joe and Erica's contact information. I think I heard they said that's okay. Uh, <laughs> happy to share that in the follow-up email from Zoom that will come out. Um, but before I, I get into uh, thanking our speakers, because I just, I love listening to you both. I'm just honored to work with you and love listening to you. Um, but this course was approved by the Florida Bar for 1.5 general CLE credits and 1.0 bias elimination CLE credits. That CLE code is 2208047N as in Nancy. And as I put into the chat, uh, the CLE code is there. And also just know you will receive a copy of this recording along with that CLE information. It will come in an email from Zoom within 24 hours. But if you need anything, of course, you can directly reach out to me. I will pause my announcements for the question that just came into the chat and I'll pick up after. I'll read it out loud. Uh, when there has been financial control and an abuser ultimately abandons the survivor in an apartment unit, what options does the survivor have without walking into an eviction or unpaid rent situation? Um, <laughs> well, I think we would definitely need to um, evaluate the type of housing that they have, because again, you may have an opportunity with subsidized housing. The rent is going to be dependent on the income of the household. Um, if all of a sudden the person who is the primary income earner is now arrested, is no longer able to live in the home. If that household has suddenly, the composition has changed, there should be a recalculation. So there may be ways for that person to still qualify on their own for that housing. Again, if the Violence Against Women Act um, applies. So if it's a, there, there's a voucher, public housing, or one of the other programs that um, were listed as participants. If it's a situation with a private landlord tenant, then I think we just need to evaluate when was the rent last paid? Is it something where you're on the lease, but you have no ability to continue paying? Do we need to explore options such as requesting that early termination? There is no statute, unfortunately, in Florida that says because you are a domestic violence survivor that that on its own allows you to terminate a lease early. But we have been successful in negotiating that, um, especially you know, the facts that, that come to us are what we're usually working with and evaluating. Um, if the lease was just signed um, or if they just signed a lease renewal and they're approaching the end of the lease, do we really need to hold them to a whole nother year <laughs> lease term? Um, so we try to evaluate all of the details, see what options might be available. I mean, I always try to see, is there any other option? Because when you're getting an initiating and a non-payment of rent action, you're starting that with a three-day notice. Three days is not a lot of time to actually vacate a unit, you know, move all of your possessions, especially after a domestic violence incident happened. But once that case is filed, I know um, there were some there was some success briefly for um, expunging or at least sealing any records with respect to an eviction so that way it wouldn't keep someone from obtaining housing in the future. But I, I also know that there's been um, a lot of action where you know someone is filing and saying this is public record there should not be this sealing of these records and uninterested parties are filing that <laughs> so we can't promise that this is going to prevent you from getting housing. There are ways to advocate against that if there is an eviction against you. But the reality is sometimes a survivor has nowhere to go. Sometimes all they need is time. So all we can do is try to advocate that to the landlord's attorney and explaining the situation saying, yes, they realistically cannot stay there. They cannot afford to continue um, paying that rent. Can we negotiate a move out? Can we do an early termination? Or what, what options exist depending again on the circumstances? And if it is a situation where the violence has resulted in some medical impacts, then it may be something where we can explore reasonable accommodation as well. So um, there, there can be a lot of options. So it's best to send them our way. On this slide, I do have the information, Joe has his information for the Fair Housing Unit. I have here um, the contact information for the statewide domestic violence legal hotline. That is something that Florida Legal Services operates for the state of Florida. We 
obviously we need to run conflict checks, but that's not something that is, um, we don't ask income information for that hotline. We just wanna make sure there's no conflict of interest. So if a survivor has a legal issue such as housing um, that's related to that domestic violence or victimization, please feel free to direct them to that line because we can certainly try to see and screen them for that. Or if you just wanna contact us based on Alex, the information that Alexis will share with you about us, we're happy to talk it out with you as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. Joe, Joe, did you want to say anything? No, you said it all. Thank you so much for everyone for coming and Alexis for hosting us. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for being here. Um, see you at the next one, which will be part four. four? Is it four? Yes, will be part four of the Domestic Violence uh, Awareness Month training series. I did drop that in the chat and that information will also come through the email from Zoom. But the next training session is the intersectionality of non-citizen survivors, domestic violence and human trafficking for pro bono advocates. It is already CLE approved and is on Monday uh, the 24th. And so again, Joe, Erica, I'm humbled, humbled to be your colleague, humbled to listen to you. And thank you very much for putting this together and being a part of my first uh, domestic violence awareness training series, which I certainly hope to make an annual event. <laughs> thank you for coordinating it, Alexis. I think it's really important. I'm glad we have an opportunity to discuss the intersection with so many areas. So thank you for all you do. And it's always great work working with Joe, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, Ditto. <laughs> definitely. Thank you both so much. My absolute pleasure. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday, a fantastic weekend, and we will see you all at the next one. Yeah, Have a good day. Bye-bye. Enjoy Bye. your weekend.